einen wunderbaren Gast auch heute wieder mit Thomas Walk. Marc Siegel wird ihn gleich vorstellen. Ich möchte immer gerne noch was zu der heutigen Veranstaltung selbst sagen, denn wir zeigen Theorema in einer ganz tollen Kopie. Die kommt aus der Cinetica Nationale in Rom und wird hier heute manuell auch wieder untertitelt von Christian Appels, unserem einen unserer Vorführer. Und äh, ja, wir sind schon sehr gespannt, weil die letzten Kopien der Cineteca waren wirklich brillant. Ähm, das, ob das heute dann auch wieder so ist, hoffen wir einfach mal sehr darauf. Und ja, wir haben wie immer ein Begleitprogramm in diesem Monat, ähm, wo wir uns Themen widmen, die ja diesen Fokus auf Pasolini etwas erweitern in der Breite. Und ähm, wir haben ja dieses Jahr leider den 40. Jahrestag seines Todes, ähm, seines gewaltsamen Todes und dementsprechend haben wir uns entschlossen, ähm, dem Thema Mord und Gewalt in Italien der 60er und 70er Jahre uns etwas zu widmen und zeigen in diesem Zusammenhang einige sehr spannende Filme, die ich Ihnen noch sehr, sehr gerne ans Herz legen möchte. Es geht los mit Der Clan, der seine Feinde lebendig einmauert von Damiano Damiani. Dann zeigen wir zwei Francesco Rosi Filme, Salvatore Giuliano und Hände über der Stadt sind die beiden Filme. Auch äh, unter dem Aspekt natürlich interessant, weil Rose ja ebenfalls kürzlich verstorben ist, wird auch gerade bei der Berlinale geehrt. Und dann zuletzt im Februar Mimi in seiner Ehre gekränkt von Lena Wertmüller. Ich wünsche Ihnen viel Spaß mit dem heutigen Abend und gebe das Wort weiter an Marc Siegel. We can't all die in bed. That was French theorist and activist Guy Okingen's response to Pier Paolo Pasolini's murder in Ostia 40 years ago this November. We can't all die in bed like Franco, referring to the Spanish dictator who died a few weeks after Pasolini. Hardly matter of fact, Hokingham's obituary was a considered argument against those who would attribute Pasolini's brutal murder to one of his many political enemies. Pasolini met the fate of the homosexual, who doesn't seek sex solely from those of his own class and race. He was not one of those good gay citizens yearning for acceptance and respectability, sticking with his or her own social class and upholding a conformist white homosexuality. If you're unsure whether Pasolini would have subscribed to Hokingham's radical theorizing of outlaw homosexuality, listen to what Pasolini himself had to say about the social tolerance of racial and sexual minorities. Tolerance, he writes, is only and always purely nominal. I do not know a single example of real tolerance. The difference of the tolerated person, or better, his crime of being different, remains the same, both with regard to those who decided to tolerate him and those who have decided to condemn him. In terms of sexual practice and theories of difference, then, Pasolini proves himself quite radical indeed. Let's call him queer. But what does Pasolini's queerness by which I mean not his homosexuality, but his perspectives on and particular mode of living out that homosexuality. What, if anything, does this queerness have to do with his films? Isn't it just a biographical detail, like say, Picasso's heterosexuality, which of course has absolutely nothing to do with his paintings? That was irony. <laughs> I can think of no one better to guide us through the rocky terrain of gay life, homoeroticism, and cinema than Tom Waugh. For almost 40 years, in journalistic and activist articles, in academic scholarship, lecturing, and teaching, Waugh has analyzed films by, for, and about gays and lesbians. He has done so with incredible charm, insight, humor, and humility. Check out the essential collection of Waugh's early journalistic essays published as The Fruit Machine on Duke University Press in 2000. There you find the playfully ironic piece called A Fag Spotter's Guide to Eisenstein. 
something we all can use, um, even if it's pretty easy to do. Throughout his writing on homoeroticism and queer cinema, Waugh has always been admirably, and for the Academy, unusually forthcoming about the desire that motivates his scholarship. Quote, I am not Roland Barthes, nor Yves Sedgwick, two great cultural critics whose personal lives are inseparable from their work. But they have been right in affirming, or at least implying, that for the queer critic especially, the element of personal desire is at the center of his or her vision and work. You can't take the fruit out of the fruit machine. And in the introduction to his magnum opus, the 1996 Columbia University Press book, Hard to Imagine, Gay Male Eroticism in Photography and Film, From Their Beginnings to Stonewall, a magnificently illustrated book he worked on for almost 15 years, much of which were spent fighting censorship and obscenity scares over the book's publication. In that introduction, he writes, I may admit with impunity, I hope, the real motivations for this study. Desire, lust, prurience of the most degrading and dehumanizing kind, to quote from a recent obscenity precedent in Canada's criminal code, end quote. I don't think that was irony, actually. I think that was humorous honesty. As evidenced by the range of his publications alone, Waugh's desire extends far beyond the skinny dipping teachers and butch Italian workers with big mustaches who receive his attention in the fruit machine. He is also one of our seminal scholars of documentary film, having edited anthologies and published numerous essays on, among other topics, the aesthetics and history of activist documentary. A number of these essays are collected in this 2011 book, The Right to Play Oneself, Looking Back on Documentary Film. And, as I just understand, he's completed a monograph, a massive, over 500-page monograph, on radical Dutch documentarist Joris Ivans, which should be coming out this year in Amsterdam University Press. Canadian cinema, and Canadian queer cinema, in particular, is another focus of Waugh's work. He's the author, for instance, of the touchstone history of sexual representation in Canada called The Romance of Transgression in Canada, Queering Sexualities, Nations, and Cinemas from 2006, as well as an edited anthology on the National Film Board of Canada and their film production. There are many other books and accomplishments, of course, in his biography, but I'd just like to mention his role as co-editor and founder of the book series Queer Film Classics from Arsenal Pulp Press in Vancouver, which he started in 2009, and which already includes, in this six-year period, 21 books, including a book by scholar Michael Moon on Pasolini's Arabian Nights. Please welcome with me the Professor of Film Studies from Concordia <coughs> University, the Research Chair in Documentary Film and Sexual Representation, and the Director of the Concordia University HIV AIDS Project, the inimitable Tom Wong. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that was too kind and too thorough. Uh, and I'm very moved by it. And thank you also for, to Vincent for organizing this amazing series this important inter intervention in the rediscovery and restoration of a very important filmmaker and artist. Uh, you may be uh, puzzled a little bit by this first slide. Uh, this is a little bit about myself. My great-great-grandparents came from Hesse, and it's very weird to be back. <laughs> exactly 150 years later, uh, they uh, 
we're from Hatharoda, which is about 100 kilometers from here, I understand. I've never been. There's the village church. <laughs> and there they are on the left. They belong to the Evangelische Bruden. And they settled on cheap farmland in Ontario, which was, in fact, uh, occupied without the permission of local Aboriginal people. But that's sort of another issue. Uh, when they settled in Ontario in the 1860s, the concept of heterosexuality had not been invented. Uh, it was really only a couple decades later, but as you can see, they were relatively heteronormative, to use uh, 20th century um, terminology. Uh, and uh, I've inherited a lot from them. They're very uh, stolid uh, sobriety. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm so engaged with Pasolini, a kind of opposite. Uh, 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 there, there's something in there, but I'm not sure what. But maybe we'll come back to that uh, later. Um, their names were Johannes and Lucia Rappel. OK? Um, <laughs> they would be quite shocked if they were to hear tonight's um, uh, presentation. Before I start, could I have a show of hands? How many people have seen Teorema? Okay, good. I think more than half, so I'm not going to spoil the plot for anyone, am I? Because I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens in the film. And I gather most of you have been attending some or many of the previous lectures. Yes, good. Uh, there's always a problem lecturing about a film before an audience uh, will see it, but in this case, uh, I feel a little bit more comfortable since I'm talking about something that you are already, most of you, are already familiar with. Okay, why queer in queer Pasolini? Some of you may feel that queer, uh, 30 years later, uh, after the founding of queer theory has become something of an academic cliché or marketing label, as you can tell from this selection. Uh, however, I would argue that contrary to many, it has not waned in its interest. In fact, it is still an extremely productive framework for understanding and intervening in culture and society. To me, uh, Pasolini, who died 40 years ago this year without ever having heard the word queer to our knowledge, although he had lots of, he knew lots of slang and vulgar uh, Italian expressions for it, I'm sure. Um, he makes this absolutely clear of the abiding relevance and pertinence and urgent necessity of queer focus on cinema and culture. And I think he would agree with queer theorists that queer and sexuality constitutes a zone of crisis. Uh, or as uh, a Canadian colleague of mine, Peter Dickinson, has said, a literary critical category of an almost inevit inevitable definitional elasticity, one whose inventory of sexual meanings has yet to be exhausted, and one that challenges and upsets certain received national orth orthodoxies of writing, and we could add um, cinema. The definition I go by just in shorthand is also from the 1990s by Anne-Marie Jagos. You see her book there on the lower left. Uh, for her, queer refers to the um, incoherences in the allegedly stable relations between chromosomal sex gender, and sexual desire. And for me, we're talking about a kind of continuum or spectrum encompassing both an identity, um, a, a fixed sense of queerness as a grid, a network of discrete sexual identities, rather, of social constituencies and strategic uh, political agendas with a cultural canon belonging to them to us through historical accident and act of construction, and of course tonight argues that 
Pasolini belongs to that canon. And also, for me, queer refers to a fluid sense of queerness as a zone of possibilities, troubling the traditional configuration of gender and sexual identities. Uh, that also paraphrases Jagos and to uh, quote Eve Sedgwick as one must. Uh, there has been a long crisis of modern sexual definition, which began at the time my ancestors left Hesse. Uh, the potent incoherences of homo heterosexual definition have left no space in the cultural in the culture exempt. These incoherences have left no space in the culture exempt. The centrality of this nominally marginal, conceptually intractable set of definitional, definitional issues to the important knowledges and understandings of 20th century Western culture as a whole, and I would extend that to include 21st century Western culture as well. Some of you may be feeling using queer to uh, attach to Pasolini is a kind of anachronism, a kind of retroactive construction of the late 20th century uh, identity. After all, Pasolini made Teorema the year before Stonewall, the American uh, landmark uprising that uh, set in motion the modern gay liberation movement. Uh, you may feel that it's much more appropriate to attach Teorema to the uprisings in Europe in May 1968 of workers and students that Pasolini himself was so much involved in and in which uh, sexual definition was hardly uh, visible. However, uh, I hope I will convince you that this is not a kind of retro retroactive uh, uh, apportioning of a label uh, to uh, an object that does not deserve it. Why Pasolini? Uh, for me, uh, this author persona is the ultimate queer text. And restoring him as a living uh, figure, a living filmmaker, a living corpus is not only important, but it is essential. Uh, there have been re-releases on DVD and other formats of Pasolini uh, works uh, over the last years, and tonight we're looking at a vintage uh, celluloid print from the Italian Cinematheque. Um, but it's not only the text, the, the films for me that are the essential queer, queer text, but the, the author himself, the author, and his oeuvre. Uh, his work as a whole, without exception, every single film abounds in which Dickinson calls a textual superabundance of a destabilizing and counter-normative sexuality from beginning to end, which traditional criticism has refused to come to, to grips with. I'm sure the 12 preceding speakers have all brought that textual superabundance to your attention. This is uh, personal uh, in many ways for me. 40 years ago, as I embarked on my career, uh, as I was working on my doctorate, Pasolini was killed, and at the same time, Salo was released. Uh, I think I was touched by his work more than by any other artist at that time, and ever since, I have continued to teach his work, each time, especially Teorema, but each time look, teaching any of his works, uh, seeing new things, making new discoveries, making fresh uh, um, recognitions of of Pasolini, the queer author, and of myself, the queer spectator. Uh, in, these, uh, in this series of photos, you see an example of here, uh, taken by the queer uh, Italian photographer, Dino Pedriali, just before Pasolini's death. There's a glimpse of uh, what moved me uh, so much by this figure. His uh, tenderness, his intellectual fierceness, uh, his embrace of scandal and provocation. Do we know any other filmmaker of his generation who's poop, who has posed nude for an art photographer? Well, I hope 
not many of them did. I hope Fellini didn't, for example. <laughs> uh, but there's something about this combined tenderness and scandal and provocation that really touches me in him. After all, he said around the same time, in a moment of profound cultural crisis that points to the end of a culture, it has occurred to me that the only intact reality is that of the body. The only intact reality is that of the body. And this posing session uh, uh, corroborates his beliefs. <clears throat> Why Teorema? Well, the obscenity complaint after the Venice Festival of 1968 in which the film was hauled into court uh, made it very clear that they knew what Teorema was about. It was about the unimaginable sense of homosexuality which permeates the work. It was eventually thrown out of court. As you can see from these uh, five publicity uh, posters and ads, not everyone, especially the publicists and the uh, distributors, agreed that it was a queer film. In fact, it's only the red one at the bottom that really gives a sense of the brilliant volatility of sexuality in the film, what I might call the pansexuality uh, of the uh, narrative of the film. All the others, with the possible exception of the Italian one on the lower left, uh, promote the film as a kind of heterosexual, softcore uh, romance starring Terence Stamp and Silena Mangano. Uh, but I really uh, rely more on censors than I do on critics and distributors and um, publicists. They really know what they're talking about. I even rely sometimes on the Assurvatoro Osservatore Romano, the <coughs> critique of the film was as follows. The disturbing metaphor by which he has claimed to represent the problem of a reality that would like to be the symbol of a transcendence is undermined at the root by the Freudian and Marxist consciousness that appears throughout the film. They got that right. I think that a queer perspective on the film is absolutely indispensable a queer uh, perspective on all of his work is indispensable, along with the Freudian and the Marxist mm -hmm. perspectives that are also uh, essential. Um, and the, the Vatican critic continued, the artist paradoxically tries to reach the shore of religion by taking opposing routes. The mysterious house guest doesn't offer the image of a being who frees and liberates man from his essential torments, from his limitations and his impurities, but he is as if a demon, the accomplice who possessing the creatures and then disappearing like a hallucination uh, leaves them overwhelmed and alienated. Well, at least they understood the plot, although I would have called Terence Stamp an angel rather than a demon. So it's very clear that queerness, the queerness of this film, acted everywhere as a kind of provocation, as a transgression, uh, and its intensification of its uh, impact uh, uh, were, were very much Pasolini's intended uh, engagement with his audience. Throughout the film, you will see not only queerness uh, in the literal line of the narrative, but in a kind of intertextuality. So watch for that. We're talking not only about references to uh, iconic queer artists like uh, Francis Bacon and Arthur Rimbaud, the poet, but to, to uh, all kinds of uh, visual iconography that are too num numerous to mention. So keep your eyes open for that queer intertextuality. Coming back to the 70s, right after Pasolini's death, what we could call gay and lesbian film studies began to emerge in earnest. Uh, there is, on the lower right, is Richard Dyer's pioneering book, Gays and Film, that really didn't come out until 1980. However, Richard Dyer did contribute to the um, 
Pasolini book, also published by the British Film Institute in 1977, which was entitled Pasolini and Homosexuality. Uh, gay, lib, gay liberation era critics had a problem with art cinema and European art cinema in particular. Its ambiguities, its contradictions, and they had trouble with the uh, queer auteurs like from Pasolini uh, to Fassbinder. Uh, Vito Russo, for example, dismissed Ludwig, the, uh, the uh, subject of um, Visconti's film from 1973, basically as an old fag with rotting teeth, uh, a very negative stereotype that we should not tolerate. Um, Richard Dyer's article in Pasolini in 1977 basically was a polemic against another pioneering queer critic Robin Wood's vision of Pasolini as one of liberation. Robin Wood had just seen Arabian Nights and had come out basically in his review of Arabian Nights as a gay film critic, a very brave act for someone so established in academia in 1975. And he argued that the trilogy was an attempt to create a liberated world of pure impulse and essential need beyond ideological determination, a world in which the living, magical identity of things can be perceived. Liberation has no more persuasive advocate. Dyer uh, was very negative about this uh, celebration of, of Arabian Nights, and he continuously argued that Pasolini showed scars of self-oppression. And he felt that his commitment to letting images speak for themselves reinforces the dominant uh, heterosexist ideology, uh, meanings that Pasolini could not control or wasn't aware of. His images inscribe dominant ways of thinking about gayness. His emphasis on adolescence and poverty for Dyer implies the older and middle class spectator, and that this stress on inequality was basically politically incorrect. And ultimately, he said that Pasolini associated gay sex with humiliation. And as for Pasolini's famous celebration of the male nude, it was um, basically objectification. Uh, Dyer was hanging out <coughs> with through a few too many early second wave feminists. So the social context of looking at the female nude that was continuously denounced by feminist critics throughout the 1970s and by art historian John Berger needed to be applied to the works uh, almost without change to the works of, of um, Pasolini. So uh, Dyer had problems with uh, Pasolini. When the British Film Institute's uh, book on Fassbinder was published the following year, no, sorry, the earlier year, there was almost no discussion of sexuality whatsoever, believe it or not. Can you believe, I mean, I know this group knows Fassbinder, and can you believe a book in 1976 about Fassbinder didn't really discuss sexuality? Well, they corrected that in their uh, new edition in 1980, which had a chapter called Fassbinder and Homosexuality by none other than Richard Dyer. And uh, Dyer is one of my best friends, and I'm not criticizing him publicly. He knows I feel this way. We had a conversation about this last week. But we were all really infected back then with the kind of gay liberation, positive image uh, aesthetics that we applied, well, he applied to European art uh, cinema in a way that didn't take it, that didn't acknowledge the, the contradiction, the ambiguities, the intensity, uh, the importance of this work. Okay, now a little personal anecdote that will end up just referring to Pasolini as a queer ethnographer. I was in Milan in June uh, at a film festival 
knowing that I was going to be coming here and talking about Teorema. And Milan, for me, will always be this, the location of two essential films in my uh, cinematic uh, culture, uh, Teorema and Rocco and his brothers by Visconti. And in both films, we see the beautiful Milan railway station. So I went to the Milan railway station and uh, took a beautiful cell phone photo of the gorgeous uh, canopy of the railway station that you see in both films. Then I thought, what else happened in this station in Teorema? Oh yeah, uh, the patriarch of the family is walking through the stations, sees a hustler or a street youth sitting outside the men's toilet, uh, stroking his groin, and the patriarch freaks out, rips off his clothes, and then runs through the desert screaming. Am I, am I uh, exaggerating? No, that's the exact plot, right? Um, I thought, okay, I'll just go to the men's room, see if it's still there, see if, see if it still looks the same. Uh, I went in, you have to now pay a euro to go in and urinate in the Milan men's room. I went in and urinated, and immediately beside me in the next cubicle, a young man turned up, basically propositioning me uh, through gestural language. I thought, I'm very busy, I have an appointment in half an hour, uh, bye for now. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll just get a photo of the <coughs> toilet to use in this lecture. So I did, and there's my photo. It's the one on the upper right. And when I got home and looked at my cell phone, I realized that the young man who had propositioned me, I hadn't noticed, was sitting on a bench outside toilet entrance. There he was. And what an amazing 45, 48 year echo of the man that the patriarch had seen himself in the movie that who is there. And this guy uh, was played by a non-professional, Luigi Barberi Barbini, who also played St. James the Apostle in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, uh, and uh, epitomizes Pasolini's taste for non-professional casting, for the almost anthropological physiognomy of his non-professional casts, uh, a beautiful man who we first cast to be a disciple and then cast to be a hustler five years later. And I thought, this is so uncanny, I have to show you. And Pasolini was clearly documenting uh, a social milieu, a social space, and incorporated it into his uh, film. Uh, Teorem is often thought of as an abstraction, as a, a parable, as a myth. Uh, one forgets that is also a very vivid documentary of Milan as a city space, of an architectural heritage, and also of a people, of people in that city, and of Pasolini's network of friends and former partners that he cast in his films. So uh, there you have it. Uh, when Pasolini was talking about the Arab literature that was the source of Arabian Nights, he made an interesting comment. What interested me most in Arab literature was not its fairy-like, exotic, or magic character, but its realism. Its realism. Has anyone ever discussed A Thousand and One Nights with You as a realist uh, piece of literature? So this is what where he was coming from in terms of constructing magic and constructing document, the documentary real. As uh, the, a French critic has mentioned, uh, it's about ethnological observation becoming lyrical anthropology. Okay, enough of that. Uh, let's talk about a little bit more specifically of recurring anthro um, iconography in Pasolini's work. Uh, 
On the lower left, you have one of the most famous shots in Pasolini's oeuvre, the famous crotch, crotch shot of the uh, movie star, the British movie star, Terence Stamp, that derives five members of the family in, in uh, Teorema into a complete uh, breakdown. Uh, this kind of imagery, or this, <coughs> this icon, the phallic icon, recurs throughout his, his oeuvre from beginning to end. And uh, on the upper right, you have two stills from Arabian Nights, from 1974. And on the lower center, you have Mama Roma, which you saw a few months ago, I believe. <coughs> And you also have two more stills from Teorema. The underwear that Terence Stamp has dropped, and which becomes almost like a sacred relic, the way the camera dwells on it in the scene where Lucia uh, and Terence Stamp uh, seduce each other. Uh, and then the scene of seduction between uh, Terence Stamp and the son of the family, the teenage son of the family in the son's bedroom where 1968 was a big year for male frontal nudity in European cinema and even uh, American cinema. It was uh, known as one of the breakthrough years in terms of uh, phallic iconography and how Pasolini persuaded Terence Stamp to join the parade is uh, something that I would, be like, I would be interested in knowing. This is not just a, a prurient um, uh, search on my part for this this continuous icon iconographic thread, I think it's relevant to uh, Pasolini's uh, interest in the sexual, but also in the sacred. And um, when you think about the plot of the film, the narrative of Teorema, it's uh, really an image of the desire that drives uh, that conducts the bourgeoisie to its destruction, isn't it? Or as um, a critic named Restizzo says, Terence Stamp is the phallus that pushes the bourgeoisie to positions of radical alterity. This is really what happens in the film. It's a very literal and reductive image, image isn't it? It's nothing subtle about it, it's blatant, but Pasolini's imagery was blatant and simple, wasn't it? Frontal. Okay, on another track. Boy, I'm running out of time. Things are going fast when you're having fun. <laughs> this is a, a, a theme that I has interested me for a long time, since the 1980s, about how there is a continuous tradition of gay male narrative in the cinema, starting in the teens and going right up until the time I published the piece in the early 1990s that there are so many gay male cinematic narratives uh, that feature a kind of third body, not the object of the gaze, but the enactor of the gaze within the, within the film. The gay male narrative subject as the looker, the enactor of desire, the creator of discourse, almost a kind of intradiegetic authorial stand-in. And very often these, not always, but very often, very often these characters are intellectuals, writers, artists, or outsiders of some kind. And just to very quickly show this sample, um, Anders aus die Andren from uh, Germany, 1919, uh, violinist, looking for Langston, uh, 1989, a poet, uh, you know him, right? Um, Death in Venice, 1971, a, co a composer. Uh, Gus Van Sant, uh, Malanocha, uh, a kind of unemployed um, uh, intellectual or wannabe intellectual working in a, a convenience store. And up here, uh, uh, Birgitta in Angst, Death, and Sela, always feels to me like a kind of gay male 
authorial stand-in. <laughs> uh, she's a, she's a, have you all seen this wonderful German film? Uh, she's, of course, a character in her own right and a very well-drawn character in her own right. So Pasolini fits right into this pattern, and I would argue that, Pas that Teorema uh, complicates the picture by offering us five uh, authorial stand-ins, not just one. They are all hitting on Terence Stamp. They are all, whoops, yes, that's right. They are all looking at him, staring at him, freaking out at his touch, and uh, standing in as, uh, for Pasolini, as the looker, as the enactor of desire. That's really the basic dynamic of the film in many ways. And this unavoidable uh, obsession, this ocular obsession these characters have with looking at the visiting angel really leads to the uh, climax of the film. It's interesting to think of them also as creators of discourse. Uh, I would make the argument that Teorema is probably one of Pasolini's most talky film. I guess maybe Salo also is in the running. But you don't think of this abstract and uh, parabolic film Teorema as a very talky and discursive film until you look at it. As soon as these five characters all have their breakdown, they start spouting Pasolinian poetry to Terence Stamp, don't they? Before you came along, I was this and this, and now I'm that and that, and you have changed my whole life, and I don't know what to do. They go on and on talking, don't they? And it does sound like Pasolinian poetry. So in many ways, they are uh, performing the Foucauldian transformation of desire into discourse. Uh, years before the fact. In the 1970s, as Pasolini became more comfortable with his, his public homosexuality, uh, Richard Dyer is a little bit condescending when he congratulates uh, Pasolini for having just come out in the Corriere della Sera, I hope I got that right, in 1975, I guess just before his death, uh, I think this is a very condescending and uh, oblivious comment about uh, an artist who had been out since the, his teenage years, always getting into trouble with the police, facing social rejection and ostracism throughout his entire career. Uh, so, uh, but as cinema became more sexual in the 1970s, as censorship was breaking down, especially in the European art cinema, I think that he uh, assumed a more explicit, uh, this, uh, more explicitly, this pattern of the on-screen uh, authorial stand-in, and there are there he is in his last four films, two, literally, where he plays uh, the the painter, the disciple of Giotto, uh, in. Cameron, you've already seen De Cameron. There's where he plays um, um, Chaucer, the British poet Chaucer in Canterbury Tales. There in Arabian Nights is the famous uh, Persian poet Abu Nuas. And here you've all seen Salo. In many ways, the four uh, torturer, uh, torturers in um, Salo are stand-ins for Pasolini as well, and this is why so many critics of the film uh, made a kind of direct association between Pasolini's self-hating identification with these, these characters. Okay, I want to touch on another topic. For all of this explicit queer uh, iconography and figural construction that we've been talking about, uh, I don't want to imply that Pasolini's queerness was a ghetto of uh, centripetal identities and communities. Uh, his work was very much an encyclopedic vision of society as a whole, 
And in this sense, he was as interested in women as he was in men, though not sexually. And in fact, we could say that his gender politics were very equal opportunity. Uh, literally, as in his consistent and repeated gaze through many of his films at a heterosexual couple, like this, uh, on the uh, left from Portile, on the right from the Decameron. But many have noticed that Pasolini had an absolutely, quote unquote, undifferentiated treatment of gender difference in which there is no privileged role attached to the male heterosexual vision but all are, so to speak, within the reach of it. Sorry, all are, so to speak, with the reach of all. This was a, um, an observation by Jeffrey Noel Smith, one of his best uh, English language critics. Uh, I think that is true. I think this, this absolute gender equity in terms of his vision of society as a whole, alongside this queer intensity, the queer intensity, of his erotic focus is something that comes out in a little sequence, a five minute sequence I would like to show you now from Arabian Nights, and I'll just set it up for you. Uh, on a caravan moving through Yemen or Ethiopia, I'm not sure why, the uh, Baghdad Caliph Harun al-Rashid and his consort Zubaida are having a familiar contest of the sexes the kind of contest that appears in a lot of medieval folklore, including Arabian Nights and Canterbury Tales, which is better, uh, guys or girls. Uh, and so they pick out a nubile, a nubile male and a nubile female uh, object of observation, and they're going to prove to each other um, uh, which is more beautiful. And so we're just going to watch that little sequence that unfolds with, I think, this absolute equity in terms of gender, um, uh, gender uh, politics. So we'll look at that now, please. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'll just wrap up with. Um, a final couple of points. <coughs> Maybe we can save this point for the discussion afterwards. What is the bloody theorem involved in this film? Uh, only Pasolini, uh, uh, when Salo came out, everyone said only Pasolini would attach a bibliography to a film, but when theorem, uh, Teorema came out, no one really focused on who would call a film a theorem, but uh, he did, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end. Uh, but basically, all uh, five characters end up either um, uh, rising to the heaven or rushing screaming through the desert, as you see at the very end of the film. and. Uh, Desire forces each of the characters to confront the real, the world of capitalism, the world of uh, Italian post-war liberal prosperity, the world of the family and family relations, and uh, they fall apart. Sex with the divine stranger, the angel or demon, however you want to take it, pushes each member to the radical limit point. So, um, unlike the closed system of Sallow, where everything is very literal and comes to an, uh, an inevitable conclusion, the theorem is more of an open uh, system. Uh, and uh, it, its ending is not really uh, an ending. I'm missing a page about hard-ons, but I think I can remember what I was going to say. <laughs> um, 
one of the British critics of Pasolini when, when the film came out uh, talked, Noel Pernan talked right frank, very frankly about its erotic address, its sexual representation, and the use of desire as this trigger for the destruction of the bourgeoisie. And he went even further thinking about the use of the erotic uh, in this cinematic narrative and theorem, and uh, he wanted to, he asked uh, whether one should be ashamed to make a film that gives people a hard on along with your story and your message. And he added, uh, should we be ashamed to respond to a film with a hard on? This really raises the, the issue of corporeal affect our personal responses uh, to films, to, especially to films like Pasolini's that are so super abundant in sexual representation and in challenges around desire, so super abundant in uh, recognitions and explorations of the body and the nude body in particular. Um, I think that uh, if we're going to understand uh, Pasolini, it's not only uh, Marxist or Freudian or aesthetic or formal theory that are going to be our essential tools, but also queer uh, theory. And the latest um, uh, fashion in academia, affect theory, I think, needs to come to the rescue as well. I think we really need to understand the intensity of his address to not only our minds, but also to our bodies, and the intensity of our responses as carnal spectators uh, to his films. So in answer to uh, Burden, no, one should not be ashamed to make a film that uh, create hard-ons, one should not be ashamed to respond uh, uh, by getting hard, or I suppose by uh, getting wet as well. I think that uh, it's a very important question that hopefully we can think a lot more about. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Thomas Wall. Und äh, wir, bevor wir mit Theo Rehmer starten, machen wir jetzt eine kleine Umbaupause von fünf bis zehn Minuten. Das Filmcafé hat hier unten noch einen Stand aufgebaut, das heißt, Sie können sich noch mit Getränken ausstatten und dann durch den Gong werden wir gleich signalisieren.